Well, welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I'm so glad that you have come along. We are in the middle of a six-part series where we're looking at the future of three denominations in the Wesleyan tradition. At first, we looked at the Salvation Army. Then in the next set will be with the United Methodist Church. But today, we're continuing our conversation with people in the Church of the Nazarene, two different views, conservative and progressive, thinking about the future of that denomination. And there is significant activity happening in some of these denominations this summer. That's why I brought that up. There's a general assembly for the Church of Nazarene. And some of these questions and the things we're going to talk about are important and helpful. And there have been some movements that have also enlivened these conversations. So I hope you'll hang around here and check this out in just a second. But first, I want you to know that the More to the Story podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And we serve a host of denominations, including the Church of Nazarene, Salvation Army, and now the Global Methodist Church. We're delighted that we have over 120 people who just in the last seven weeks have signed up for a course of study with the Global Methodist Church. And we would love for any of you to consider a degree here at Wesley Biblical Seminary. We offer bachelor's, master's, all sorts of master's, MAs, MDivs, and a doctor of ministry degree as well. So you can check us out at wbs.edu. Secondly, I'm thankful to my friend Keith Waters and WPO Development for their support of this podcast. Keith and his team do feasibility studies, mission planning studies, and capital campaigns all around the country. They've helped churches, organizations, schools, um, and more than 250 of them have successful capital campaigns. So if you're looking for those type of things and you need to kind of develop a plan and figure out how you're going to get there, I highly recommend Keith and his team to you. You can find a link to him in my show notes. Finally, at andymillerthe3rd.com, that's andymillerii.com, there's two things there I want you to know about. First, if you sign up for my email list, I will send you a, a tool. It's called Five Steps to Deeper Teaching and Preaching. There's a video, and then there's a PDF document that could be really helpful for you if you're trying to go deeper in Scripture, but also to think about how you can communicate that message in a creative and fun way. So you can get that by signing up for my email list at andymillerthird.com. And there are several other things there that you can find, like, including my course on the book of Jude. This is a great small group resource, six video sessions, discussion guides. You can find that on the course tab if you go to my website. All right. I am really glad to welcome Brian Powell, who serves as a district superintendent for the Kentucky District of the Church of the Nazarene. I almost said United Methodist Church, Brian, for the Church of the Nazarene. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Andy. It's uh, yeah, I'm grateful to be here. Well, one of the things that's happening with this series is I'm featuring voices from two sides of the aisle, so to speak, the progressive and conservative voices on issues related to denominations and their future. And this has not been a debate conversation. So when I've had people on who I certainly disagree with, and I had Tom Ord on, and that would have come out a week before this comes out, um, and you guys didn't see each other's responses. You all, you both had the exact same questions. My goal is not to debate either of you, but just to push for clarity. What is it that people believe? Where do they think the church should go? Because I think there are significant differences that need to be weighed out by people who are making decisions. So I appreciate your willingness to come on and be a part of this series. Yeah, it's a, like I said, it's an honor. I would say that um, I guess I am filling the conservative slot. Yeah. Uh, although I, I struggle with um, identifying with those terms, progressive and conservative. Yeah. I yeah. feel like it's so tied to uh, American culture and Western politics. And uh, we, we're just Christians, right? Or we're not. Yeah. Uh, thank you for saying that. And I've actually probably said that in all three of the other podcasts, too. It's like those titles are somewhat of a placeholder, and it's a way to get people interested. I'm, I wish there was another way to describe it. You know, in my. No, I get my, it. Yeah, it's a hard it's way. And I don't, don't want to be confused with politics. It, it's hard to find a way to describe it with all that's going on today. I mean, some would say orthodox, biblically focused, but yeah. then the other side might, uh, they, they might both claim that. So, yeah, right. Um, so thanks for your willingness to take that title, uh, even though it might not always be a perfect fit. So, I am, yeah, and I'm just. Brian, tell us a little bit about you, and just a just a little, a little short bit about what you're doing, and like what the role of a DS is in the Church of Nazarene. Well, I oversee uh, the district of Kentucky, which is a uh, community, a network, if you will, of uh, over a hundred churches at this point. We've planted. 74 churches since 2015 
And wow. we're doing all kinds of work, not just traditional works, um, doing a lot of compassionate ministry efforts. We have planted uh, a lot of international churches, including Hispanic, African refugee churches, Haitian. We've got one Burmese church. So the Lord, we're, we're, we're planting churches anywhere that they'll open the door and let us start holding services and calling people together under the name of Christ. Yeah, beautiful. I love hearing that. And later this summer is the General Assembly of the Church of Nazarene. Could you tell me a little about what happens at that event? Well, the uh, General Assembly uh, for the Church of the Nazarene, we are an interconnected denomination globally. And our General Assembly happens every four years. Uh, this time, I think it's been six or seven because of COVID. But um, it's kind of like a big family reunion, uh, a, bit, a homecoming, if you will, where delegates from all over the world come together to um, worship and celebrate and rejoice and also make decisions as the Holy Spirit leads uh, about the future and the direction of the church, especially as it pertains to our manual or our book of discipline, uh, our guidebook, if you will. And yeah. so, yeah, that's, and every district has a, their own district assemblies every year. And then of course, yeah. the general assembly again is every four years. Gotcha. That's helpful. Okay. Well, we'll get right into the questions here and then I'll just try and push for clarity here and there sure. and follow up every, every so often. But these are the same questions that I asked Tom as well. So the first one is this, the Nazarene statement on human sexuality in the covenant of Christian conduct is the denomination's current position on human sexuality. What, if anything, do you think should be changed about that statement? Wow, uh, that, that's a big question. It's, I know. In some ways, I think it's exactly as it needs to be. Okay. Um, in other ways, I think there could be some nuance uh, or some either less explanation or more. It's interesting, you should ask, I was recently asked to participate in a project, and I contributed a chapter to a newly released book called Biblical Sexuality, Why the Church of the Nazarene is Right. And right. I, believe you know, I believe you know some of the editors of that book, Dr. Hey, Matt. He shares a wall with me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm Matt, if he can hear. <laughs> but um, it was just released this weekend, actually. So, so, so first and foremost, I think the simplest answer is, I believe the Church of the Nazarene gets it right with our manual statement on human sexuality. Okay. Um, but, but I find the current statement, it's beautifully written, it's well thought out, it's consistent with God's created order. Um, it's, it's con it upholds a high view of scripture. Yeah. And uh, beyond that, I think it's very redemptive uh, in, in its wording. It, it calls the church to be welcoming. And at the same time, it doesn't try to justify sin that is associated with broken sexual behavior. Yeah, yeah. And and so, like I said, I fully support the, the current statement. With that said, yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as I know, the Kentucky District, uh, our resolution committee here, is the only resolution committee I'm aware of that has submitted a resolution to the upcoming General Assembly to amend parts of our statement on human sexuality. Interesting. Okay, so, let me so, let me ask you something again, real I agree quick. With it. I don't disagree with it. I fully support it. Yes. But I think there could be some more clarity, if you will. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, well, let me ask you a little bit of the history of what this statement is. Um, I've heard some talk about it. There was probably a committee that was put together not long ago that developed the current statement. Could you do you know anything about that? You know, I, I mean, there's all what the these resolutions go to committees at General Assembly. So before we go to the to the full assembly hall where all the delegates go and vote, they're all we're all broken into subcommittees. Right. And so a resolution a resolution has to pass through a committee before it makes it to the, the floor at General Assembly to for for any sort of change in wording right, right. Or, or whatever. Um but I do know that sometimes they commission committees to work on certain important issues. And I think years ago, which that seems recent, but I mean, it's been six years since our last assembly or, or how long has it been? It was 17. Okay. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. Set six, seven years. And so that committee would have been put together the four years before that, I would think. So that's been 
quite wow. some time ago at this point. So when I read the statement, to me, it sounds like something that might have been written 10 years ago. Now, I, I mean that with not with not too much of a criticism because it's beautiful, like you said, but it's almost like since that time, the implications of the sexual revolution within the life of the church have oh, gone yeah. a more extreme direction. So I'm not entirely surprised that there might be an amendment to this. So what is the amendment that your district is um, is putting forward? I, I, I would love to talk to you about some of that. Um, and, oh, maybe you can't uh, now. No, I can. Okay. I, can. I want to. Um, it, it's not that our current statement, again, is wrong. I want to really clarify that from my perspective, yeah, yeah. theologically speaking, but only that there seems to be some unnecessary phrasing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and what, what we're proposing would actually make the statement more concise, if you will. Yeah. For example, the current statement uses the word sacramental in describing marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as part of the Protestant movement, yeah, sure. our articles of faith as Nazarenes only refer to two sacraments, right. right? The Lord's Supper and baptism. On the other hand, we teach that marriage is covenantal. Right. And, and while I understand the significance of the word sacramental, um, I, I believe that it could create some unnecessary confusion, especially since we're a global church right. and the influence of Catholicism around the world. Um, it could create confusion as to whether we believe marriage is a sacrament uh, or a sacrament because officially we do not. Yeah. And so one small change that that we've recommended is replacing the word sacramental with covenantal, sure. which aligns more clearly with our position on marriage. Um, again, it's not wrong. Right. It is sacramental. It is a sacred thing. Um, and if, if we were to go down the road where maybe the church wanted to include it in our articles of faith under the sacraments, <laughs> then... Um, then maybe we could use that terminology. But from, right. from my perspective and from many others, that's one small thing that I think could make it more clear. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. Is there something else? Yeah, there, there, there is. Um, considering the broader scope of the manual, um, some, might, some might contend that there's repetition in our current statement on human sexuality or, or repetition in the manual in general. And indeed, um, no doubt, there are several places where there seems to be unnecessary emphasis on something that's already been made clear in another part of the manual. Interesting. For example, I'll give you an example. Okay. You've read our statement on human sexuality. Right. And there's a paragraph in there that uh, is the paragraph that, that speaks of sexual activity between people of the same sex. Here's what it says. Quote. Because we believe that it is God's intention for our sexuality to be lived out in the covenantal union between one man and one woman, we believe the practice of same-sex sexual intimacy is contrary to God's will for humanity for human sexuality. Um, personally, now now it goes on quite yeah, quite, yeah. quite a bit longer. Personally, I feel like that the statement could end there. Just, sure. just in there, it's it's against God's will for human sexuality, and maybe to align with some of our other statements, maybe one small sentence, it is therefore sin, right? You know, but instead, our current that that one paragraph currently goes on beyond what I just read and says this quote: While a person's homosexual or bisexual attraction may have complex and differing origins. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the implication of this call to sexual purity is costly. We believe the grace of God is sufficient for such a calling. And we recognize the shared responsibility of the body of Christ to be a welcoming, forgiving, and loving community where hospitality, encouragement, transformation, and accountability are available to all. Mm. Um, that seems like a lot. Yeah. It's I mean, not that you don't support those things. Like you said, no, it's not wrong. All. And I, I, it's interesting, um, just to give you my outside non-Nazarene sort of perspective on that, is I, I think in general that we, we do want to ensure that we're leading with love. And that's certainly the critique, is that we're not being inclusive to people, those who hold to an orthodox position on human sexuality. Just the mere thought, just the mere idea 
is not welcoming people. Well, so we then bend over backwards to ensure that we say things. And it seems like this statement is doing that because it wouldn't stop any church from ensuring that people would know that they're welcome, that they're, we recognize that there are disordered uh, attractions or whatever there could be. I, I guess, brother, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist. I, yeah. I strive diligently to walk alongside pastors and leaders of, uh, from all backgrounds um, with all um, kinds of emphasis in ministry um, but with what you just stated, it, it almost feels like it's reactive. Sure. And, and I just don't believe the church ever needs to be reactive, right? Um, we already say in that statement and in other places that this sort of language, we, the people of God are marked by holy love, right? Right, right. We already speak to the transformation that is available through Jesus Christ. And so those last several sentences, which are long ones, while they're in alignment, they just seem to be unnecessary as, as they give the section uh, like a, an added emphasis on something that's already clear. Right, right. Uh, another thing that, that I could point out is that there's one word in there in particular, and it's crazy that, that we nuance words, but that's really what we do at General Assembly because right. words have meaning. But I think it's noteworthy to point out that no other sexual sin in our statement deals with the origins of mm -hmm. the temptations. This one, the one on same-sex relationships, does. The roots, if you will. Um, only the paragraph dealing with homosexuality. Now, our article of faith on sin, which is orthodox doctrine, right, yeah. Deals with those issues in detail. It speaks to original sin or depravity, our sin nature, and it also speaks to personal or actual sin or violations of of the law of love. And so um, it, we just don't get into origins and roots. And if we're going to do that with one sexual not sin, sure. why would we not do that with all? And I'm also an advocate that our manual should be thinner. Yeah, sure. It seems like we keep adding to it. Yeah. Like if you look at the, some of the early manuals, they were just really, they were really thin. Yeah. Um, I, I guess it, it, it's a bit bewildering for some how much time we devote to homosexuality or same-sex relationships versus how little time we seem to give to other forms of sexual sin. Yeah, sure. Now, 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 again, I want to reiterate, I don't know who might watch this. It doesn't matter. I mean, I'm an open book, but I also want to be balanced in my, um, I fully support the current statement. Right. Um, I, I'm fine if no changes are made to it because it's well-written. I mean, in my mind, it reads almost like a sermon manuscript. You could sure, preach sure. that article, right? And I, and I have used it in such manner, but it just seems like to me that our current statement now, I'm going to say this. <laughs> it seems like it's heavily influenced by Western culture. Hmm, interesting. And not all of the church of Nazarene is in a Western context. Am I correct? The majority of us are not. Yeah. The majority is not. Well, what do I mean by that? I'll tell you, the church of the Nazarene, we're global. You already know that. We have, yeah. I think the last report was 2.6 million members worldwide. Okay. So in addressing human sexuality, it seems to me that we should consider that there are cultures around the world where other forms of sexual temptations are more are a more significant problem. Right, right. right? Um, yet homosexuality in our interconnected global book of guidebook, yeah, gets most of our attention, and it's reflected in that manual statement. Um, why is that? Yeah, why do you think that is? <laughs> Yep. Well, it's who's bringing it to the, he's bringing yep. it to the table. Yeah. I can, I can, uh, the only reason I can think of is that it's a prominent issue in the West. Yeah. And if that's the case, then our statement on human sexuality needs to be balanced considering that we are a global church. That, that's so it should, logical. Maybe it should include things like polygamy and the like. Well, it does include those things, but it doesn't give a third of the attention. Right, sure. All right. For our, our current statement addresses um, 
of course, sexual intercourse outside of marriage. Right. It addresses homosexuality, as we're speaking of, adultery slash divorce, polygamy, pornography, uh, sexual violence of any kind, uh, rape, assault, abuse, incest, sex trafficking, forced marriage, female genital mutilation, bestiality, although that's spelled wrong in the manual, sexual harassment, and, and the sexual abuse of minors or pedophilia. But for most of those, they just get mentioned. Right. They don't go into specifics about um, some of the, the other challenges uh, about bestiality. They don't say bestiality comes no, because they, there are internal problems or whatever. And we don't no. say, and we're, we, we want to extend, uh, you know, we want everybody, uh, all, all folks, I don't even know what you call those folks. What do you call someone who? Uh, Sorry, you're them? asking the wrong person. Yeah. <laughs> we don't, but you know, either, either we should be, have the same sort of graceful language toward all the sexual sins. Yeah, or just make it all succinct, in my opinion. Of all those, all those sins mentioned, homosexuality gets more than double the attention in our current statement. Yeah. Everything else, except sex outside of marriage, gets a small portion. Adultery, divorce gets us, and polygamy gets little attention. The rest just get a mention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in other words, we devote a whole lot of space to homosexuality and mm -hmm. little space to all the others. And in my mind, I can only reason the re that, that, that logic would tell me the reason that is, is because we have the propensity to cater to Western culture. Right, right. Which I trust on us. We're a global church, right? Yeah, this is really interesting. So, um, you know, people who go back and look at the, the two interviews from both sides will find the, the answer to this question really interesting. I'm going to move us on, Brian, just because I want to make sure to get to other questions. I know we both have a kind well, of a hard I say stop. one last oh, thing? Go, oh, well, go ahead. In 2021, we reported 860,000 members on the Africa region. Wow. Compared to 590,000 in USA Canada region. Africa, according to that report, has grown by 56% in the last decade in the Church of the Nazarene, whereas USA Canada has decreased by around 11%. Wow. So now, now consider this in thinking of our, the global implications of our statement. When it comes to sexual sin, guess what's more prominent in Africa? Polygamy. Yeah, sure. All right. But our manual only dedicates one sentence to that issue specifically. And that again, it's, it's perplexing because it, it, it just leaves us to conclude that Western culture heavily influences our current statement. So again, I wanna say before we move on from this, I align with our statement. It's perfectly fine if it remains in current form, it's orthodox, but I feel that decluttering it in light of the global context makes sense. This is good, it's so interesting. I wanna just tell a quick story that's connected to this. I attend a church that is going just voted yesterday to be a part of the Global Methodist Church, but in their process where they were looking to affiliate with another denomination, there is a Global Methodist Church and another denomination. And when the other denominational representative came and dis described their book, they described how there's a lot in their book of discipline or whatever it's called that um, hasn't been updated since the 19th century. And it had all sorts of like very specific rules sure. about um, how people should dress, what they should do when they walk into the church and all this. And it's, it was non-essential. Non absolutely. <laughs> but, but they're, but they're in this book of discipline sure. and the very perceptive question came from somebody at our church as they were listening to this said, uh, so if you're, if you're not going to update your book of discipline, but how can, and they brought up the idea of enforcement. Well, how are you going to enforce it? And honestly, probably our church went to the global Methodist church be, in part because that wasn't a very good answer. So I just want to encourage you, Brian, uh, and I, and whoever's a part of this resolution or amendment, it's good. It's good to focus sure. more and to refine what you're saying. So I think this is a good move. Okay. Number two. The Board of General Superintendents recently ruled that doctrine for the purpose of the denomination includes the Articles of Faith, the Covenant of Christian Conduct, and the Covenant of Christian Character. Do you agree with this? And if so, well, let's just start there, and then I have another quick follow-up. You know, um, 
Do you have the BGS ruling? Have I'm sorry. I, I've seen it. I, I've yeah. seen it. Well, I, I'd like to just read it real quick. Okay, it's, go ahead. Go ahead. It's a short ruling. Here's what it states. Quote, the articles of faith, the covenant of Christian character, and the covenants of Christian conduct are essential statements of the doctrine of the Church of the Nazarene. Statements of the doctrine of the Church of the Nazarene, as well as those portions of the manual pertaining to what we believe and how we live in light of those beliefs. So in other words, pertaining to orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Yeah. Faith and practice. Um, now, undoubtedly, you know, our, our statements of doctrine, meaning our teachings, yeah. what we teach as far as what, what we believe and how we're called to live out what we believe, they're found within the articles of faith in our manual, for sure, yeah. and the covenants they're found within the covenants as well, especially the practical aspects as far as living that out. So first and foremost, much like the previous question, I want to say I support this ruling wholeheartedly. Um, however, I do understand why it has received some pushback, you right. know, in our tribe. I have a limited perspective. I wouldn't dare try to speak for the BGS. By the way, we have a great board of general superintendents. Uh, anointed leaders. Uh, I'm very good friends with many of them. Um, but from my limited perspective, there's reasons why such a ruling was necessary, especially in light of the antagonistic nature of progressive leaders right. who are always looking for a loophole. Right. That, there's this, it's just, that hasn't it always been that way though? Like, uh, I mean, Paul, Paul in, in Galatians, Paul addressed the legalists, you know, who, right. who were trying to add to, add to, and, and then you have Jude and Peter addressing the Gnostics who were trying to take away from, take away from. It's the same old story, man. You know, it's the yeah. same spirit. This is spiritual warfare. Um, it, it's just a different decade. But uh, again, I don't speak for the Board of General Superintendents, but, but I imagine they're asserting that our doctrine that's found within those statements are essential to alignment with the Church of the Nazarene. And right. this emphasis is needed because of these aggressive, progressive clergy and voices who are at this point just openly defying right. sure. beliefs. I mean, the global consciousness of our church has rejected any other way of interpreting LGBTQ issues. We've, we've made it clear. We've actually spent a lot of time on it, more time than I personally think is, is needed. Um, yeah. But, you know, historically, when, when, when the church universal speaks of doctrine, we're, we're referring to the basic tenets that characterize the Christian faith, right? right. I mean, we believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? We, we believe in creation. We believe in the fall of man, sin. We believe Jesus uh, came and lived and died. I mean, we the atonement and the cross, and we believe in forgiveness of sins and salvation and entire, I mean, all that stated. Our doctrines as Christians also are those things which make us different from other religious groups, right? Mm -hmm. um, and our articles of faith in the Church of the Nazarene align with the classic tenets of Orthodox Christianity. Yeah. And I think they were just making that clear because there's been so much talk, so much debate in recent years about essentials and non-essentials. Right. You know, especially when it comes to salvific issues. In other words, what is essential to being in a right relationship with Jesus? Right. What is essential to that? I think that's an important question, actually. Yeah, this is so good because one of the things that can happen is that there's a distinction between the what we believe and how it's lived out. And so in my tradition, we have 11 articles of faith that are really short. And then we have a, a therefore in that statement that says, I will live this way. And then that clarifies some of the implications of that. So you're well, saying our covenants, like, would, our covenants would be similar to your therefore. Gotcha. You know, we live this way. I mean, we're talking about this is what we believe. And we agree to live in accordance with that. And this is what that looks like. Yeah. 
this is really good. It's it's helpful. Like we have got to think through these issues, and this is how uh, challenges come. And I think it's helpful for us to be able to ex expose where the where the affronts uh, um, to orthodoxy could come from. And a lot of times it comes through those extra statements. So I think based upon what you said, it's interesting that the the board of G general superintendents has made this ruling. Okay, the, the third question is this, and, and this is a kind of like getting into your personal view. Um, what will happen if your position on scripture, human sexuality, et cetera, those type of things does not win out in the denomination? I'm, I'm going to kind of tie this to the last question a little bit. Okay. Uh, and then and then I'll dive into that. But as, as Christians, from the very beginning, we believe in the authority of Scripture, the 66 books of the canon, correct? I mean, right. we, in other words, we believe the Bible is divinely inspired. Right. And from the very onset, Scripture has been accepted as the ultimate source of knowledge and revelation about God. It reveals everything necessary to right. be in a right relationship with Jesus. And, and so, you know, we're dealing today with strange teachings, okay? It's interesting to me that the new, we should be following the example of the New Testament writers. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you think? It sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting to me that New Testament writers never had an issue with calling out, publicly calling out false teaching. Yeah. Never had an issue with it, addressed it head on. Today, however, it seems like that those that point out false teaching are considered the bad guys. You know, they get criticized, villainized, while those uh, teaching false doctrine could just go on about their lives. It, it's such a weird transition. But the bottom line is, Andy, we have clergy, laity, Actually, more than a whole lot of our leaders want to admit, in my opinion, who are actively pushing to change right. essential doctrines related right. to human sexuality. And, and so we're at an impasse here. We're at an impasse. No, I believe, I believe because, you. I, every denomination is hitting it. Yeah, because such a change would mean denying the authority of Scripture on same-sex behavior. It yeah. would mean denying the authority of Scripture on homosexual clergy who are in practicing relationships. It would mean denying the authority of scripture on gender ideologies or, or natural order or created order. Currently, our position would prohibit those things. Yeah. Um, but, but for years, these progressive leaders have tried to reimagine, if you will, or, or redefine what we should consider biblically and theologically essential, because they know that unless the global consciousness of the church is willing to affirm human yeah. sexuality is not essential to salvation, that they cannot engage those views without the possibility of church discipline. And right. I think that's actually sad because I think it ought to be certainly church discipline, not the possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I back up, you said every, every church is dealing with this. You know, I, I've had a lot of... Uh, well, many. I should have said many denominations. Well, no, I agree with you. Yeah. I, I think every... Um, I've had a lot of colleagues in conversations over the years, you know, that they, they run up against the wall of discouragement in, in seeing, you know, with social media, this stuff's just so out in the open anyway. Right, right. And they're like, brother, I just don't know if I can stay if we're going down that road. Right. And, and I'm like, well, where are you going to go? Hmm. Where are you going to go because what we're dealing with is spiritual warfare on a higher level than we've ever faced it. And, and in, in that sense, this is a cultural issue that's pressing in on the church. It's a cultural issue that's pressing in. It's a battle of ideas, which is yeah. spiritual. It's what it's always been about. It's what it's always been about. I mean, when we think back to, G, I, I like to give this example when talking about a battle of ideas, spiritual warfare, when we think back to Jesus's baptism, um, the, we, we know that the father opened up the skies and said, this is my beloved son. Yeah. And I'm well pleased. The very next chapter, he goes out into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. And what is, how does Satan tempt him? I mean, he doesn't attack him physically. It's a battle of ideas. He whispers in his ear. And what does he whisper? Yeah. If you really are the son 
Well, God yeah. had just affirmed yeah. that this is his son. And then how did Jesus respond? We use the book of Deuteronomy in every response. It's interesting to me, too, that Jesus used the Old Testament throughout his preaching ministry. Mm -hmm. He never once tried to correct anything it said. Mm. <laughs> if there would have been a problem with the Old Testament teachings, don't you think Jesus would have fixed it? Yeah. Um, if he did anything, he just took it a little further, right? Yeah, he, <laughs> no doubt that he did. But, but, but anyway, there's nowhere to get away from this. It's a cultural issue. Every denomination is dealing with it. I even know independent churches that are dealing with it because people in leadership in those churches are changing their mind on these matters. Right. Um, and so anyway. Well, Brian, let me ask you something specific. What, what, let's say the shoe is on the other foot, so to speak. And let's say that maybe the last couple of general assemblies and including this one, they supported, let's just say, a progressive view of human sexuality. What would, what would that mean for you? What would you do? Brother, I would follow the Lord. Again, I don't think there's, I have, right now I've been entrusted right. by the church to oversee a, a, a certain region or district, if you will. Right. And I would lead those people faithfully. If I went back to the pastor, I would lead my church faithfully. Because at that point, like, first of all, I don't ever see that, not in my lifetime, happening in the church. I mean, we're global. We've got as many delegates coming from Africa and other parts of the world as we do America. And most of our tribe, they're never going to go along with such a change. Yeah, it's a hypothetical that I'm putting out it there. It would create massive division. And, and uh, you know, I'm unsure what it might look like. But one thing I know for certain, it would fracture our structure, our organizational structure, probably beyond repair. We would become more federated in, in that sense. Yeah. But, um. You know, I mean, we're dealing with these voices. I, I know Tom uh, is going to be my counterpart in this series, but he recently edited and put out a book called Why the Church of the Nazarene Should Be Fully LGBTQ Plus Affirming. Right. There's also a group called the 1908 Project that's openly campaigning for people to sign petitions in favor of becoming fully affirming. And beyond that, there is ongoing dialogue that's been happening on social media in social media groups for years that continually push this same narrative. Um, so again, back to the BGS ruling. I believe their ruling is a diligent effort to maintain some sense of unity and be proactive in the face of these ongoing attacks. Um, unfortunately, I feel like we, we sometimes miss that genuine unity isn't possible when essential doctrinal issues like marriage, sexuality, natural order, those things are up for debate. Again, right. we're, at, we're at an impasse. I mean, yeah. if we've learned anything from church history, we'd be naive to think there's a way to bridge that gap. And even recent church history, sure, certainly if we've learned anything from the UMC and what's happened. Absolutely. In Methodist, yep. Certainly we've learned that, that we right. will never be able to bridge that gap. Yep. I mean, you this is a... Me you might have to remind me of the the, the question again. Yeah, you know, that's good. I think you got to. I think that, that that's the point. And I think there was a probably more than t about 20 years ago, the Methodist General Conference met. And again, like they fortified their doctrinal statements. But um, one one leader recognized, and that leader's no longer with us, just said, well, it, perhaps it's time for an amicable separation. And many people said, oh, it's too soon. We can, we can do this. We can work it. And what right. happened? Got is work. that there was never discipline was uh what there was never accountability so a whole uh, region would move to a place where they had a practicing lesbian bishop that was installed and a host of other things so the the discipline there was essentially there wasn't unity uh because right. people were deciding they were going to disobey as a result of um their convictions and so i think that that's a, a helpful piece to keep in mind let me ask you this i think about the other side oh you want to add something there real quick i, I think you asked something about uh, what would happen if, you know, my yeah, position. I was exactly. I, I am curious about that. Go ahead. And, yeah, that'd or, be or great. The church's give... position. I mean, anytime we move away from scripture, what does that equal? Apostasy. Yeah, that's a, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, did Did you Did you read the story a couple of months ago about the Methodist College in the UK that released a professor by the name of Dr. Aaron Edwards? Yeah, Cliff College. Yeah. 
Yeah, he, he, they, they said he brought the college to disrepute on social media, threatened to report him as a terrorist even. Yeah. And friend, that, that is the fruit of progressive Christianity. That, that's it. And, um, you know, he said homosexuality is invading the church. And evangelicals no longer see the severity of this because we're so busy apologizing for our barbaric homophobia. Mm. This is a gospel issue. If sin is no longer sin, we no longer need a savior. He went on to say the acceptance of homosexuality as not being sinful is an invasion upon the church doctrinally. That is not controversial. It should not be controversial. The acceptance of it is controversial. Right. And the global church, he said, agrees with that. Yeah. And so, you know, I would contend that the biblical position on God's design for human sexuality has already won out. Right. You, you, you know, I mean, it's, it's so clear. Uh, we don't have the right nor the freedom to reimagine 2,000 years of biblical orthodoxy on this issue or any other issue. And if the Church of the Nazarene were to abandon its call to, to Scripture on this topic, then it would mean also that the Church has abandoned Christian orthodoxy, right? Right. right. And in that regard, it wouldn't be me or, right. or anyone else I know leaving the Church. It would mean the Church has left us. That's right. That's right. Right? Yep. And, and uh, anyway, it, you know, it wouldn't course, be the same Church. It wouldn't be the same Church. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it might I have think the that, same name, but it wouldn't be the same. Personally, I've been watching this. Uh, I, I'm I'm getting old now, but I'm I when I first started this, I was the youngest DS among my colleagues for several years. Yeah, so I am kind of young to be in this position, but personally, I've watched this play out for the better part of a decade. Yeah, and in trying to point it out, I've I've been told over and over, "You're overreacting." Yeah, it, it's not that bad. Oh, they don't have any influence. Oh, you're wasting your time. I've been involved in these discussions. I've been I've been bewildered by them. I've been involved with in person and online. And through my engagement, I can point out specific shifts in the progressive narrative in our own tribe on LGBTQ plus issues. Can I give you some examples? Sure. Um, several years ago, I'm saying, I don't know, 2015, 16. Online and otherwise, you would hear leaders saying saying things like this. I don't personally agree with same sex marriage, but I'm okay with those who do. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that they weren't they weren't breaking any rules by saying that, right? According to our manual, then it shifted to well, I, I'm working through what I believe. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right, and then it became oh, I believe God's okay with same sex marriage within the confines of a monogamous, monogamous relationship, yeah. but I won't perform a ceremony because of our denomination's position on the issue. Well, today they're saying, I believe we should change our position on marriage. I think yeah. the church has got it wrong on this issue historically, and I think the biblical writers has got it wrong. Paul right. got it wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Jesus um, was wrong. So again, that's not the Christian faith, because you have to just, you have to throw out the, the New Testament writers. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I, I, it's interesting. I'm glad to hear you. I haven't, don't know if I've heard somebody ex expose kind of that trajectory. Um, and some might say it's a slippery slope, but my friends, this is reality. And this is yeah, what's it, here. It is. Um, that, there's that, nothing to say. Happened. You won't be able to say very soon um, that you're okay also with um, a thruple, you know, not no longer a couple or in or other sort right. of. Right. Where does it thing. go? What okay. I want to make sure we what keep moving here. So, one thing that I have is, um, yeah, exactly. What is the plus? I, I hear you. Um, uh, number four, what do you think the primary issue is for those who are on the other side of the theological spectrum in the Church of the Nazarene? I, I want to be kind um, because, again, I don't, I don't view people as an enemy. And I really want you to hear my heart when I say this. This is not personal to me. Like, I, I have a lot of friends, people I know and love, who f who have become progressive in their theology. Yeah. Man, they could come over for a cookout tomorrow. You right, know, right, I, right. I have zero enemies. Um, It's a battle of ideas. And, and I think it's so important to keep that at the forefront of the conversation. That Because it's so tempting, and I've seen so many fall victim to this mentality. They become bitter. 
and they become angry. You know, how it, it, in, in light of the prodigal son story and those three characters, how do we keep the heart of the father in this mm-hmm, conversation? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, we definitely don't want to become the elder son yeah. who, who didn't have to leave home to get lost. Right. 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 Wow. In, his, Good in his own bitterness and resentment and anger. And it was yeah, very yeah. obvious that he'd been holding on to that for a long time. And in this battle of ideas, it's easy for that to play out in somebody's life if they're not careful. So so in getting into this this question, uh, I, I want to make sure, even if I say some hard things, that it's not personal. Right. That I'm OK with people having a hard critique of, of my views. I don't take it personal. But the primary issue is that they've abandoned Orthodox Christianity. Uh, uh, Apostasy is not part of the spectrum of Christian belief. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a departure. The Apostle John said that he was dealing with those folks who had gone on ahead, gone on before. Uh, 2 John 1, 9, everyone who goes on ahead does not abide in the teaching of Christ, and does not have God. It's whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Now, I think we're dealing today, it's an age-old problem. It's nothing new, and I think it would cause a lot less. It's new to us. It's new to people pastoring and ministering in 21st century America, post-Christian culture, But I think we're dealing with the same issue the New Testament writers dealt with. And the the progressive mindset, if you do a parallel study, man, it's the same as the Gnostics. Mm -hmm. These are folks who, in their own minds, have outgrown biblical orthodoxy. They've lost interest in Scripture, and, and, and they feel the need to reimagine it. I mean, that these, these are the kind of personalities that fit well in a spiritual organization that espouses modern cultural inclinations. Novelty is what's most appealing to them. Not deeper revelation, spiritual discipline, novelty. In Jude's day and ours, that's why I say it's no different. These same folks would be considered trailblazers, right? Trendsetters, forward thinkers, advocates of noble causes. It's the same spirit. Progressive Christianity is nothing more than ancient Gnosticism repackaged. It's the same demon, different day. Wow. And I don't say that to hurt anybody's feelings, but if I'm going to be faithful with biblical hermeneutics and exegesis, that would be the application for our day. I'm with you. Now, this is interesting. I'm, I, I agree on all those fronts, but I, I don't think that they would say like what's motivating them. We really want to implement a uh, neo-Gnosticism right now. I mean, what do you think they would say like their reason for this is like, what, what doctrines would they hold to? I, I, I don't, I don't know what doctrines they hold to. I mean, I, I, I've, they, they've, they speak so low of scripture I mean, some of them, I think, hold to the creeds, but the creeds are all, all bound to Scripture. Right. They're all, they all uh, derive from Scripture. I, I think, it's, I think it's, it would be wise as Christians to remember, maybe I can give an analogy here, that Christian growth, growing as a Christ follower, definitely includes growing in knowledge. Would you agree? I agree, yeah. But, but it should never lead to a lack of conviction. In fact, the longer one walks with Jesus, the more convinced they should be of things they were once unsure about. Yeah. Does that make sense? And and so many today, and here's the Gnostic tie, they seek intellectual enlightenment at the expense of confidence in divine truth. They'll abandon divine truth as revealed through Scripture. For enlightenment. And and, and so often these voices, you know, you'll hear them talk about, and and I understand this, and you will too, Andy, you know, as as youthful Christians, a lot of times everything's black and white. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we know everything's not black and white. And as we grow, we're able to to navigate the gray areas. Um, and, And I admit that, but everything's not gray. 
Right, right. There are some things that are still black and white. Right. And, and the basic orthodox foundational teachings of orthodox Christianity are black and white. And human sexuality, God's design for us, is one of those things. If you ever noticed it, progressive enlightenment, when it comes to the church, it, it seems to cause people to condescendingly look, look down on those that they think have yet to graduate from, from youthful ideas to adult refinement or right. sanctification, right? I contend that growing in knowledge in Christ means contending for truth. Yeah. And if it, if it doesn't, uh, it, do, it certainly doesn't mean abandoning truth. And if it does, then it's something else. It's not Christian growth. So this progressive quest for enlightenment, it, it, it makes people think they're growing in knowledge when in fact, it seems they're growing in doubt, mm, mm -hmm. which is the opposite of knowledge, right? Yeah. I mean, doubt would be the opposite of knowledge. So if our doubt is increasing when it, as we walk, the longer we walk with God, then certainly we're listening to the wrong voices. Yeah. You know, so we're learning from somewhere else. Christian growth should never lead to decreased conviction about biblical truth, about right and wrong, about good and evil. To right. the contrary, when we lose sense of bi our biblical conviction on these basic things, that's a sign that we're moving backward, not forward. Interesting. That's helpful. Oh, I want to jump ahead because we might not have enough time, and I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead to a higher education question. One of the things that's unique about the Church of Nazarene compared to some other uh, Wesleyan holiness denominations is you all have established in the United States, at least that I know of, really strong, successful um, universities, uh, Olivet, Trevecca, Point Loma, Northwest Nazarene, Eastern, these, these schools have been established. And it's interesting, um, looking from the outside in, as I've, I've noticed that there are often members of the faculty who take alternate positions to the Church of Nazarene, particularly in the departments of religion. Um, and this has been something that now it seems like there are there are there have occasionally been moves to work uh, to enforce that things that aren't contrary to the beliefs of the Church of Nazarene. But these are all institutions that carry the word Nazarene in their name. Sure. And I'm just curious how you respond to the fact that the and likely your church some way is financially supporting these institutions. Likely they are incorporated in a way that the church was involved with institute, like bringing these, these bodies, these institutions into existence. So what, what's to be done like about the institute, these institutions of higher education, Brian? You know, every district superintendent um, serves as by default of the position serves as a um, trustee at their respective university. Our, our USA Canada region is broken up into fields. Okay. Those fields of districts, um, you know, are, are linked to the university that exists okay. on their field. And so they serve that university. And so some do a really good job um, of, of bringing a, a, a accountability to the table and others over the years have not done so good of a job. Um, I would, I would be reluctant to speak. I've only ever, ser I've served on two fields in my life. Okay. Uh, the Olivet, which I would say for lack of better word to use your words is a, is a more conservative uh, of our schools. Okay. And then Trevecca, which, which also, I mean, Trevecca, first of all, with liberal arts education, when you when you examine that from the local church's perspective, I don't know if there's ever been a time in history where it wasn't perceived as liberal. Mm, okay. Right. I mean, sure. you're sending students off to explore ideas, and it's outside the box of, of the local church. And people tend to be scared of those things because they tend to live in a bubble, which I think is a terrible mistake for those folks in the local church. Right. But that doesn't mean that that they are. You know, it doesn't mean that they are unorthodox. Right, right. There's also the differentiate. We have Nazarene Bible College. Right. And we have Nazarene Theological Seminary, which stand alone outside of our region, our universities on each field. Um, we need to also understand that Trevecca, for example, which is where I currently serve. I mean, man, they've got over 4,000 students. I forget. Yeah. And, and how many faculty? Lord knows. Um, 
if I tell my pastors who sometimes, you know, ha have opinions on Trevecca, I say to them, if your church was 4,000 people and you had hundreds of staff members, you would have problems. Yeah. You would have more problems to navigate. People would be bringing different ideas all the time. There's no doubt that philosophy and, and religion departments, you're going to get professors from time to time that that's going to, you know, change their views and start teaching contrary. My question is, is do we handle those situations? Right. Trevecca, for example, uh, I believe the number was nine. I think we had nine professors step down last year because we still asked them to sign uh, a statement saying that they agree to abide by our covenants of Christian conduct and character in our manual. And right. some could support that. Okay. I mean, those are the things that don't get PR. The only thing that gets PR is when something bad happens. Mm. You know, right. it's like, okay, some professor or even a clergy member somewhere teaches some crazy thing and it's online and everybody's got access to it. And it's just like this negative energy. And uh, what never happens is when those situations get handled, they don't right. put out a press release, right? So, so a lot of people are left wondering if they're handled. I actually think I've got a friend and I'm not going to say what denomination he's with, but he's a superintendent in another denomination and they actually do press releases when they part ways with professors and clergy that that abandon mm. orthodoxy. And they don't do it in a negative way. Mm. Uh, when they take their credentials, they just put out a press release saying, um, you know, so-and-so, we're going separate ways, and we want to wish them all the best in their future endeavors. Yeah. So, so that their people know that it's been handled. It's a, it's a, for an accountability purpose. But... um. I think that the link to the church has has kept our institutions faithful. Okay. I do also think that there are a lot of leaders who who typically do not want to get involved in controversy. And I'm mm -hmm. trying to be careful here because I love my colleagues. Yeah. But man, they avoid it at all costs. And Dealing with false doctrine is not something we can do and avoid controversy. It's just not. Right. No, that's a, it comes with the game. It is not possible. And so, um, you know, I, I've how do how much more time do we have? Well, it's just how much time you have. You have ten minutes. Could you go? Or you go. Yeah. It's got five minutes. Okay. I am. Um, what, what? There's no doubt, though, that we've dealt with issues. And and the larger we get, the more issues we'll deal with. Mm -hmm. But I've also seen a, a valiant effort in the regions I've served in to bring a source of accountability to the table in dealing with those issues. Um, I'm debating on, 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 maybe. let me ask a question. Let me, let me see if I can like specify this a little bit more. So let's just say it's not about dealing with human sexuality or even the doctrine of revelation or creation, which is surrounds a lot of what we're talking about here. What if it was just the dual natures of Christ rather than uh, Jesus was truly and properly God and truly and properly man. What if a professor at one of those institutions teaching in a religion department, uh, teaching, uh, maybe future Nazarene minister or, or at your seminary or at the Bible college said, no, I'm I'm taking a new view on that. Jesus was just God. He was not fully man. Uh, should there be some action taken in yes. that situation? Yeah. Yes, for sure. And there would be. Um, I, I would assume uh, in our in our universities. You know, our seminary in recent years has, and and that's one of my alma maters. You know, okay. I graduated with my doctorate from there, and I love our seminary. Um. I do know that the hiring practices of our seminary in recent years has not reflected um, our statements uh, okay. on human sexuality, as there have been some professors hired there, uh, faculty and staff, who have, um, you know, who openly teach contrary. Yeah, I also know that some of those that that's been addressed and many of those have been released. Although I know one that is of one that's still on faculty and maybe it's just a part-time position. Nonetheless, uh, they do advocate openly uh, for same sex relationships. I, we, we had a personal issue with our district several years ago. Um, 
and I don't want to go into all the details of that. We don't have time. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure that I should anyway, but, but it was very perplexing because I had some conversations with the trustees there and other leaders there. And in, in asking, you know, just simply asking about that, I, I often received, well, Brian, don't you think we ought to have diversity when it comes to higher learning, even if we don't agree on everything? And my response was, well, sure, I believe that we ought to have diversity on non-essentials, mm -hmm. but I certainly don't think we should have diversity on essentials, um, especially the things that our manual calls essential. Right. You have a, a document that makes it and clear. for some pushback. I, I think I meant I, I pushed back on them. With, so, for example, I said, would you hire a free will Baptist scholar? Right. Who doesn't believe women should be in men, lead pastors for the sake of diversity, even if they were a great scholar and promised to never teach that there. But they held that view and they blogged about it and preached about it and talked about it. Would you hire them? Mm hmm. Would you hire a scholar from, you know, I asked, would you hire a scholar from, say, the, the, the Assemblies of God? Yeah, sure. Brilliant. Who believes, though, that speaking in tongues is, is the baptism of the Spirit? Yeah. Would you hire them? Because from my estimation, neither of those views are essential to salvation. You know, whether somebody believes women should be in ministry or not is not essential to them making it to heaven. Right, right. And being in a relationship with Jesus, whether one believes in speaking in tongues or not, is not essential. But sexual practice outside of God's revelation would prohibit yeah. one from being in a right relationship with Jesus. And, and it's just odd the answers I got to, to just those, those, that pushback was well, they admitted no, they probably wouldn't hire those people. Right. Well, it's odd yeah. to me that you would hire someone who openly defies our position. You should say, why don't you just believe in more diversity? Isn't right. it good to have diversity? Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, it, it was, it's just been perplexing, but I think also revealing. Revealing. Yeah. That's it. Okay, let me just get a quick answer on this last one. I'm going to go to question number six, just for your, your sake. Uh, should the Church of Nazarene keep a unified manual, or should there be greater flexibility for regions to address particular questions of faith and practice? This is kind of the contextualization argument. This is happening yeah. in every denomination, again, that's global is facing the same thing. Say, well, it's okay for that section, but we're different. We're um, we're more advanced, or <laughs> sometimes that's the language. Yes, 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 we should keep a unified manual. There you go. Without a unified manual, I mean, we might be an association. Right. We might be a federation, but we wouldn't be a global movement. Mm. You know, and, and, and there, there would be nothing... To bring a, I think people so overlook the importance of accountability. Accountability is not a bad word. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Right. Yeah. And and really, this idea of of not abiding by the manual is, or somebody having different views of the manual is, really, that's the whole point of the issues that we're facing today. Too many people are looking for loopholes and trying to reinterpret essentials. The the manual is a source of accountability for the global church. It is the global, it represents the global consciousness of the family. Yeah. Right. And, and so without a unified manual, uh, I mean, all it would take would be one progressive voice at somewhere, at, you know, in one classroom or one pulpit in any given context on any given continent to start teaching new doctrine. Right. And then what would happen? It would just be a, a cascade effect. Well, we think it's okay to have multiple wives. Yeah. Okay, well, your manual can say, and and well, we don't consider homosexuality sin. So we're going to take that out of ours. And 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 we don't think women should be pastors. And we think you ought to speak in touch. You know, I mean, you could go yeah, on. Yeah, no, and, absolutely. It would never end. It would never end. It would cause so much chaos and confusion. Um, I'm of the mindset, even if it means we were to get smaller first, I don't yeah, think no. numbers really matter. Right, I think sure. faithfulness to scripture matters and God brings the harvest. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting. Just to encourage you, like when, when the church has been clear on this and sadly what's happened, 
what's had to happen with the Meth United Methodist Church or the Global Methodist Church is I, I just see it being a very vibrant time as the church is focusing in on orthodox beliefs and being able to like what, what they're talking about when I when I get around and I've interviewed some of these people, um, bishops in the Global Methodist Church are saying, man, we're so excited. We're going to plant a church, churches in Seattle, you know, and like they're, they're, they're speaking and like we have an opportunity to do these yeah. type of activities. Amen. So. Brian, I'm so thankful for your time. Um, I just want to encourage folks, if you the type of theology that Brian's supporting. Now, you may you may not want me tagging this advertisement on here, but this is why we have several Nazarenes coming to Wesley Biblical Seminary. And like we're in this and we we're a non-denominational school. But if you're looking for a a, a seminary that supports this type of uh, faith, this sort sort of tradition, this theology, hey, check out wbs.edu. How about that advertisement, Brian? I love it. I would say, too, that I appreciate Wesley Biblical Seminary. You guys are doing a great job. I've got a lot of colleagues that have been there and are currently there, um, and um, I, I'm so thankful for your steadfastness. I would also like to make a plug, if you don't mind. Go, go, do it. I've got a podcast. I just Ooh, there it is. a sixth episode. It's called A Time to Speak with Brian Powell. Okay. It's available on most all podcasting hosts. Um, you, you can find it um Apple, Spotify, about anywhere, a time to speak with Brian Powell. It's not video, it's just audio, but I address, mainly it's a platform to address a lot of these issues that we've spoken of today. Gotcha. So if you want to go deeper, check that out. Um, and I'll, I'll, if you can send me a link, Brian, I'll make sure to include it in the show notes. All and right. also we'll have a link to, for the new book that just come out that uh, Matt and Elijah Friedemann have just edited that Brian's Biblical contributed sexuality. to. There Why it the is. Church of the Nazarene gets it right. That's right. And my uh, Janet Dean, who's been on my show, Jared Henry, yeah, um, some of the people in that. Right. Uh, and there's even an article with Robert Gagnon. So it's, it's really a great, great book. So great resources. Thanks, Brian, for coming. I really appreciate your Thank time. Thank you so much, Andy. God bless you, brother. <laughs>